Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's Free CompTIA A Plus Certification Training Course on Network Connections. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we'll look at the requirements from our CompTIA A Plus 220.702, Section 3.2, where we need to install and configure a small office home office network. We call those SOHO networks. And there's a lot of different connection types you might see in a small office network. Let's step through each one of those and get a feel for how that technology can help us communicate between devices. One of the oldest ways of communicating between devices is over a phone line using something called a dial-up modem. Modem is an abbreviation for modulator demodulator. It takes the digital signals inside of your computer, converts them to analog, something that we can hear with our ears, and sends them out over a phone line where on the other side there is another modem that answers the connection and is able to convert it back from sound, that analog noise, back into a digital mode on the other side. It's extremely useful, especially because it's using a phone line, and there are phone lines almost everywhere. However, if you've ever communicated over a telephone, you know that it's not the best clarity. And for that reason, this lack of frequency use of those limits the amount of bandwidth we can put through a phone line. These days, it's a relatively slow type of technology, and we really only use it for connections for utility functions. Maybe at midnight every night, we have an automated process that dials up from a remote location, and it simply transfers a very small file and then hangs up the phone. A very short phone call like that is perfect for a dial-up modem when you don't need to have an always-on network connection. One of the first higher speed connections for networking in a home office environment was something called ISDN. This is an ISDN router right here. You can see it looks very similar to the routers that we use on our cable modem networks. We have a place to plug in Ethernet. There's a console connection. Here's the ISDN link that you get. And you have this ISDN connection that's installed by your phone company. And it's using standard phone lines to transfer this ISDN connection. But coming into your house, this integrated services digital network is not like a phone line that's an analog connection. As the name implies, it is a digital connection coming into your house. So using ISDN became very, very useful because it was a very reliable digital connection. You just had to make sure that there was an ISDN connection on the other side that you were connecting to so that you could bring up what tended to be about 128 kilobit per second connection. And given that our modem connectivity was only going at about 56K, this doubled the speed of that. But even those speeds were relatively small to what we have today. But since this was one of the first digital connections we had in our homes, it was in many ways the precursor to DSL. These days, DSL is a much more uh, broadly installed uh, type of technology, especially for internet connectivity. DSL stands for Digital Subscriber Line. And again, it's a digital connection coming into your house. Technically speaking, it's something called Asymmetric Digital Subscriber Line. You may hear people refer to it as ADSL because of that. Again, it's using the telephone line, so it's something that almost everyone has in their home. The download speed of this, though, is a lot faster than the upload speed that we have. So that's where you get the asymmetric part of this. You generally don't see a symmetric digital subscriber line where you get exactly the same speed download as you have upload. There's also a significant limitation to DSL. Not everybody can get DSL because you have to be about 10,000 feet away from the central office or less. If you're farther away from the central office connection, the digital signals degrade too much. You're not able to communicate very well over those links, and DSL isn't really going to work very well for you. In fact, the farther away you get from the central office, the slower the connection is going to be. So you're never quite certain until you first plug in on exactly how much bandwidth you're going to be able to get through there. Although the theor theoretical maximums for a DSL tend to be somewhere around 24 megabit on the downstream side and about 3.5 megabit on the upstream, almost nobody sees speeds like that. They tend to be much, much lower than that. About 10 times that amount of speed is what's commonly seen in people's homes. Sometimes you get a little better. Sometimes you get a little worse. It's really going to depend on the quality of the phone line and how far away you are from that central office. These days, we're seeing faster and faster networks coming into the home. One very fast type of network is a cable modem network. 
And then we call it that because it's coming into your house on your television cable. Now your TV cable is turned into a connection that provides you with television. It provides you with data for your internet connection. It can also provide you with voice. We'll talk about that in a moment. It uses a format called DOCSIS, Data Over Cable Service Interface Specification. And that DOCSIS is, runs at different versions. And as we begin to evolve the different versions of DOCSIS, what you'll see is the speeds over these cable modem networks will get faster and faster and faster. These days, we tend to see speeds anywhere from 4 megabits per second. And on some very high speed networks, that's 100 megabits per second on some of these higher end uh, and newer formatted DOCSIS networks. So it's a type of technology that's really useful in the home because it provides an always on connection to the internet. And it's got some very nice bandwidths to go along with that as well. But what if you are not anywhere where you might have a cable connection? What if you're in the middle of a farm in the middle of Kansas and there's no local cable provider? Well, now you can also get internet connectivity through a satellite link. You simply put a, a huge satellite network connection up at your house. We call these non-terrestrial networks because we are leaving the planet Earth and bouncing that signal right off of a satellite. It does require a bit of ex extra equipment. You're going to have something outside your house pointed at the sky. You'll probably have a specialized modem on the inside of your house. And because this is going all the way out to a satellite and back, we tend to get relatively long amounts of latency. So if you're using an application that needs very fast turnaround times for those packets, this may not necessarily be the technology for you. We also tend to see this a lot in utility type environments. When you're on a cruise ship, they always have a satellite connection for their data. Uh, many uh, places you go that's a gas station may not have the luxury of bringing in a cable connection. They might also have a satellite dish on top of their facility. And it's probably one like this that's communicating data out to the home office. You can get pretty good speeds through this, though. You can transfer data up to 5 megabit per second. And over a wireless connection up to a satellite and back, that's pretty good. The next big jump in providing us with connectivity to our house tends to be Ethernet coming right into your home. This is what is really considered the most popular local area connectivity in the world. The Ethernet networks are ubiquitous. No matter where you go in the world, what country you're going to, there will be an Ethernet network there somewhere. This is based on a standard created by the IEEE called the 802.3 standard. You may see that written on some of your Ethernet equipment. There are many different ways to plug in Ethernet. Ethernet has really evolved quite a bit over the years, where it started out at 10 megabit per second, then 100 megabit, then 1,000, and now we're up to 10 gig networks. So we're starting to see very different types of cable used for those. There can be different categories. Most of everything we use these days is an un untwisted pair. And you can see the UTP right there. Older Ethernet networks, you really don't see many of these anymore, ran over coaxial networks. Not quite like the coax that comes into your house from your cable modem, but same methodology there. It's a specialized type of coax that was used for Ethernet networks. Those speeds really range from very slow to very fast these days. So when you're buying and you want to optimize your Ethernet environment in your home office, make sure that if your laptop supports a one gig connection, that your local modem, router, or whatever you're using to connect to the internet can also support one gig connection. And that's for your communication within your house. Obviously, you're not going to have a one gig connection to the internet from your home, but at least your communication between devices internally will run as fast as possible. A technology that continues to evolve is one called Bluetooth. And this is one that we generally associate with our mobile devices, but we could also put into a broader category of a personal area network. The idea of Bluetooth was that we had too many wires on our desk. What if we were able to get rid of some of those wires? Everything is still local on my desk. I'm not communicating over a very long distance. But maybe now I'd like to have my keyboard work over a Bluetooth connection and my mouse to work over a Bluetooth connection. That's exactly where we are these days. It's not just for these earpieces that go into your ear and your mobile phone. We really are using them for many, many different purposes around our desks, around our portable devices, and other things. There are a couple of different kinds of Bluetooth. We started with Bluetooth 1.0, which was a relatively slow standard. It really ran at about 100, uh, about 1 megabit per second. There was a lot of interoperability problems between the different Bluetooth devices. It was a brand new technology. Some phones couldn't work properly with some earpieces. 
Bluetooth 1.2, really 1.1 and 1.2 came out, which improved on that. And we had better connectivity, much better discovery of the different Bluetooth devices. And we have uh, the Bluetooth 1.2 really added a lot of functionality across many different devices. These days, Bluetooth 2.0 tends to be the prevailing technology. It's faster, runs at 3 megabit per second. And there was an update to Bluetooth 2.0 to take it to 2.1 where it does much better pairing. So now you can find if you're in your car, you step out of your car, the Bluetooth automatically will switch from your car to your ear set, for instance, so that it can just automatically follow you without you pushing a lot of buttons. It's becoming a much more ubiquitous technology. We're using it for many more things these days, and we will continue to see the Bluetooth specification evolve as time goes on. It's remarkable how mobile we've gotten with our connectivity these days. And technologies like this, this mobile broadband, really allows you to have a connection to the internet from almost anywhere. Anywhere you can get a cellular phone connection, then you can get a data connection to the internet. It's a relatively emerging technology. These are some relatively new. You've got a USB connection that plug in. And this is a MiFi from Verizon that has not only the ability to communicate out to the cellular network to give us data to the internet, it also has a built-in access point. So you can connect to this via your 802.11 connection. Very handy. The speeds, though, are going to really be dependent on the technology from the carrier and how you're connecting into this network. But generally speaking, you can get a few megabits of connectivity from these devices. I've timed my MiFi to be about one and a half megabits per second on the download, for instance. And when you are mobile and you have no connection whatsoever and you're in an airport or a hotel or in the middle of a field somewhere, that's some very, very good internet connectivity to have. And in some cases, that's faster than what many people might have over the DSL connection they have at home. So a very impressive technology. And that's another one that is emerging and continues to evolve and get faster faster and faster all the time. I mentioned our cable providers and our network providers giving us voice communication over these networks. And voice over IP, or what we abbreviate as VoIP, is something that gives us that functionality. In fact, I've got the pictures here of my voice over IP modem from my cable company. I just took a picture of it that shows the cable connection going in. I've got an Ethernet connection coming out for the data that I use on the computers and the wireless access points in my home. And notice there's these regular phone line connections, these RJ11 connections going right into the back. I have two different phone lines coming into my house all coming from this cable modem connection. I don't have a local carrier for my telephone. My telephone, my cable television, and my internet connection are all coming into this one box in my house, and it's handling giving me voice communication on my existing phones in my house. So I don't have to have specialized phones. This is just like I was plugging into the regular telephone network. Now you can also set up your computers to be a voice over IP telephone for you as well. This is a good example of that, an application called Skype that allows me to hook up a microphone and uh, I can hear from my headphones and communicate to anybody I'd like over that ethernet connection. And I've communicated to people in other countries at many different times of the day as I was traveling to many different places, all because I had that Skype capability there and I was sending the voice communication as digital packets over the existing internet connectivity. I think we're going to see more and more voice over IP continue to evolve and continue to roll out into many different places as time goes on. Let's review what we've learned about these network connections. Our first question, which high-speed network connection uses existing telephone line circuits? Well, we were just looking at some like that when we started talking about ISDN, and especially DSL. And our keyword there was high speed because DSL is one of the fastest things that you're going to find running over standard phone lines today. The next question is, which networking type is best described as a personal area network? And it's called a personal area network because it's for the things that are local to you. There's a limited distance for this type of network, and that is the Bluetooth networking. And our last question is, which technology can transmit telephone calls over packet-based networks. We were just looking at that, and that one box that I have in my house to do everything also provides me with voice over IP technology, or what we sometimes will abbreviate as VoIP. 
That covers our requirements from our 227.02 section 3.2, where we've looked at many different connection types, dial-up, broadband, LAN, Bluetooth, cellular, and some basic VoIP communication. If you'd like to see any of our free a videos, you'd like to participate in our message boards, or much more, you can visit our website at freeaplus.com. <laughs>